me, my passion for scripture really, uh, really got sparked when I realized that this, for me, is the most concrete way that I can hear the voice of God. Because we take scripture so seriously at Shoreline, it is a part of everything we do in every discipleship ministry, but really in every single ministry that is a part of Shoreline Church. We teach God's word, we try to live according to it, and we just make sure that all of our leaders, um, that we believe that the Bible is truly God's word and we're doing our best, to pursue living according to its teachings. Scripture really is the heart of women's ministry. It's the thread that connects everything we do from women's Bible study to mentoring and mops. Scripture is the foundation that we base um, each ministry on. That's where we draw the, our truth from. What I really try to do is convey the truth that God is saying in his word um, and help them internalize it and help them to, to live that out in their everyday life. With Shoreline's mission being to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ, that total commitment to Jesus Christ aspect, we learn what total commitment looks like by opening God's word. Uh, the Bible sets the standard for what God wants from us, how he would have us live, what kind of uh, thoughts and words and actions um, that he desires from us. And so we look to scripture to figure out what total commitment to Jesus Christ looks like. And that's really what the goal uh, of Shoreline Church is, to make disciples who are making more disciples who are totally committed to Jesus. We, we measure what matters in life. Consciously or unconsciously, we're always measuring things. If it really matters, we measure it, we pay attention to it. And we talked last week about kind of the, the guiding principle that if our character isn't right, all the spiritual disciplines won't really make sense. So we talked last week about making sure that the fruit of the Spirit are alive in our hearts and our lives. If you weren't here, go online, listen to that message, kind of get caught up as we are walking into this Metrics, Measurements That Matter series. But today we're talking about the Bible, this book, God's Word. We believe it's God's truth given from him for us to lead and to guide our lives. And so I want to give you a few numbers, a few measurement things around the Bible. The Bible, interestingly, is not one book. The Bible is 66 books spread across many centuries, written by many different people, all inspired by the same God. But, but some of the Bible is poetry. Some of the Bible is parable or stories. Some of the Bible is a narrative giving a historical journey of what happened at a specific time with specific people. The Bible has all kinds of different literature within it. And so when I was first given a Bible at 15 years old when I became a Christian, I didn't really have the kind of classes we have at Shoreline or training or Bible studies. I was just told, this is God's word, you're supposed to read it. And I kind of figured that out as I went along. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up with a Bible. I'd never opened a Bible before. But I have to tell you that this book has absolutely changed my life. And the God who speaks through his word continues to transform my life. Uh, the Bible actually has, listen to this, 1,189 chapters. One, you say 1,189 chapters, that's a long book. Well, chapters in the Bible are only one or two pages long. So don't panic. <laughs> say, okay, read three chapters of the Bible. That's usually three or four pages. It's not 60 or 70 pages. Uh, interestingly, in the very middle of the Bible, in the middle of all the chapters of the Bible, the very central chapter is Psalm 117. The book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible. It's, it's poetry. It's, it's declarations of praise to God and worship and, and giving the story of God's people. But in the very middle of the Bible, of all the chapters, the center chapter is Psalm 117. It happens to be the shortest chapter of the Bible. I have it written on a scroll here, and I want, I want to read the entire psalm. This entire, I'm going to read you an entire chapter of the Bible. Here it is. This is the whole, it's two verses long. Let me read the whole chapter to you. You ready? Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. If you want to memorize the whole chapter of the Bible, <laughs> there it is. Get this one under your belt, okay? Memorize Psalm 117. Now, to give a perspective, two chapters later is Psalm 119. And Psalm 119 is about the Bible itself. Every verse of Psalm 119 refers to God's truth. It'll say your precepts, your word, your laws, your statutes, uh, and, and your commandments, but it's all talking about God's word. 
Now, uh, Pastor Keith, give me a hand here. This is Psalm 119. All right, just take that and kind of start walking back for me. All right. It's a little longer than Psalm 117. Same font, same everything. It's just, you got it? There's more? Okay, there you go. Every verse, is, now if you're going to memorize one, start with Psalm 117, work your way up to Psalm 119. But every single verse talks about the goodness and the truth and the beauty of God's word. So Keith, roll that back up for me. You don't get to keep that. There you go. Thank you. Uh, but, but Psalm 119 kind of tells the story of God's word and how he wants to speak to our hearts through it. We're going to think today about this, this book, the Bible. It's interesting. Uh, there's different numbers. If you ask how many copies of the Bible are in print, studies would show between 2.5 billion and 6 billion Bibles. Well, why such a big discrepancy? Because many of them, as a matter of fact, most Bibles are actually printed and given away for free. So they don't go through a publishing process in the same way. They don't get counted. But there's potentially up to 6 billion Bibles all around the world available in different languages for people to read. I was given my first Bible at 15 years old when I became a Christian. Didn't grow up in a Christian home. Didn't talk about the Bible at all. Didn't know any Bible stories. I knew nothing about the Bible. Became a Christian. Someone gave me a Bible. Revised Standard Version Study Bible. So it was a Bible with also sort of academic study notes, giving historical background and context of each book of the Bible in each chapter. And, and I read through it. And I'll be honest with you, some parts of it were really hard to understand. I was 15, grew up in Huntington Beach, California. I didn't grow up in, you know, Palestine, you know, in B.C. I grew up in Huntington Beach, you know, 1970s. Different world, Right? And so I, but I read through the whole Bible and there was parts I, I, that really hit my heart and spoke to me. There were parts I'm like, I don't get it. I'm not sure what that means. But I just kept kind of working my way through. Then I started going through it again and trying to keep really, every day, trying to read the Bible and understand it. Then I took my Bible one day and I had this sweet, beautiful, kind of, kind of puke green Opal Manta, my sweet little car I bought for 500 bucks. Um, set my Bible on top of it and drove off. And when I got to wherever it was I was going, it wasn't still there. I went back where, it, where I had left from and I couldn't find it. And I remember thinking, I, at first I thought, oh man, I had all these notes I'd written there and all these different prayers and things I'd learned. But then I thought, well, maybe God wanted somebody else to have this Bible. And so I went out and got this. So this is actually my second Bible. Same, revised standard version, exact same Bible. And I, and I studied, I used this for about four years of study and reading. And then this is my third and this is my fourth. And I got a bunch more in my office. I, th this is my Bible I use right now. It's got about six months to another 12 months and I'll move to another Bible. Because I like to read it fresh every, you know, every so often and just kind of start with a, a blank page because I take lots of notes and highlight. And, and so uh, I, just, I just have learned that God's word is so powerful. And I want to challenge you to get, kind of have your own Bible and to, and to let God speak to you through his word. And that's what we're going to think about today. So here's our first question, a big question, the why. Why should we measure our personal engagement with the Bible? Why should we say, well, you know, how much do I read the Bible? How often do I read the Bible? Am I getting through the Bible? Do I know the whole story of the Bible? Why does that matter? If you're a note taker, you can, there's a place in your bulletin to write some thoughts down. Here's three reasons why it matters that we measure our personal engagement with the Bible. First, because it is God's breathed truth to humanity. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, all scripture is God breathed. The idea is that the Holy Spirit of God breathed, spoke. The, the word for, for breath, for wind, and for the spirit in the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, and that this passage was written in, are, are the same word, pneuma. Breath, wind, spirit. It says all scripture is breathed by the very spirit of God. Now, how exactly did that work? There are volumes written on this. As a matter of fact, we're gonna have a thing on the website that's gonna give a list of about five or six really good books that you can dig into that go through the history of the Bible, how it was canonized, how it was put together, the whole, the whole background, and why it's reliable uh, and, and why we can believe historically that it's been, it's been gathered in, in a responsible way. But ultimately, we also have to say that I believe that God's spirit in a unique way breathed and spoke through, through people across centuries and different parts of the world, writing at different times to different people, and yet God was superintending over all of that. I believe that with all my heart. And there's some great books that we will refer you to that you can dig into and spend you know, 20, 30, 40 hours really digging into and studying that if that would be exciting for you. And, and I hope it would be for many people. But it's God's God's God breathed truth. Why should we measure our personal engagement with the Bible? Here's the second reason: because we need light and guidance in a dark world. We should know we're digging deep into God's world because word because we need light. Psalm 119, that psalm that I just shared with you uh, on that long scroll, verse 105, verse 105 says, 
Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. We need guidance in this world to know where to go and how to walk and how to live. And this book brings it. In a world that is so dark, it shines light. I believe that reading this book helped me know the woman that I should marry. I really believe that, that this book guided me to marry Sherry. Now, I didn't like read and, you know, Hesitations 422. By the way, there's no hesitations in the Bible. Um, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't like read, okay, it says, and, and you will meet Sherry Lynn Vleem, her maiden name, and you'll fall in love with her, and that's who you, that's not in the Bible. But reading this book showed me the kind of person God would want me to marry. Somebody who loved Jesus, who lived with humility, who cared about people. It guided me to the kind of person, and, and maybe more than that, reading this book every day from the time I was 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, it showed me who I should be, how I should love, and how I should live, so that when I met the right person, they would actually be interested in me, because I was becoming the kind of person that the Word of God says I should be for a wife someday. This book shaped and guided my journey, and does in virtually every decision I make in my life. Sometimes I'm conscious and aware of it. Sometimes it's just God's just speaking to my heart and filling my mind. But God then prepares me for the right decisions in the right direction. We need light and guidance. Number three, the why. Because God still speaks. And the clearest voice we hear is through the Bible. God continues to speak through this book. And, and I believe, I will tell you, I believe that God speaks through dreams. I believe that God speaks through visions. I believe that God speaks through other people. God speaks through circumstances. God speaks through the still small voice of his Holy Spirit. God speaks in lots of ways. But at the end of the day, I measure every time I think I hear God speaking against the Bible. And if what I hear or feel in my heart lines up with the Bible, boom, we're good. If what I hear and feel doesn't line up with the Bible, then what I hear and feel is wrong, and the Bible's right. This is the guide rails for my life, and any other way that I sense God is speaking has to line up with God's word. This is the primary and strongest and clearest way. You can open this book every day of your life and read this, and you can know you are hearing from God. I believe that. If you really believe that, then you want to open this book. You want to hear from God. The other, the other night, Sherry got me to do something crazy. Uh, she got me to go to bed at 9.30. Um, <laughs> I don't go to bed at 9.30, but I, but I went to bed and I fell asleep. So at 2.30, I'm awake. And my body's like, you're done, get up, start your day. And so I, I did what I do virtually every day of my life. I got up and I went to my study and I sat down in a chair and I opened, I got, had my Bible, the Bible I preach from and, and, and read each day. And I had my, my journal and, and I opened up where I'm, right now I've been going through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then I'm going to go into the books of Chronicles. That's what I've been reading in my own, not for preaching for you, not for, just, just for God to speak to me, because I want to hear from God. So I happen to be in Second, second uh, Kings chapter 4. And I read this passage, and I'm not kidding you, I'm totally serious. I'm sitting there by myself, I'm not preparing for a sermon, I'm just meeting with God and saying, God, speak through your word. I, and I always ask, Spirit of God, speak something that I need to hear. And so I read about three and a half chapters. I think it was three or three and a half chapters, but this one part jumped out at me. So I lingered here. It's just this little story about a guy named Elisha who was a prophet. He followed Elijah the prophet, Elisha. And here's the story that I read, just sitting there in my study. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two sons as his slaves as payment for his debt. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And here's her response. He says, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask for a few. <coughs> then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. Take that little one you have and just start filling these jars. Doesn't make sense mathematically, but spiritually he's saying, you know, something's gonna happen here, something amazing. So, so he says, go, go inside and fill all of the jars until each is filled and then put it to the side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. Then all, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, 
Go and sell the oil and pay off all your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left, on the extra. I sat there in my study with that passage in front of me. And, and, I, be, and I began to write down just some things that hit me. And, and, I, and I'm not a big, like, super long journal writer. I don't write, like, pages and pages. I just write little thoughts that strike me. But this, this particular day, uh, I, I, out of that one story, there were six lessons that God spoke to my heart. One of them was, was when he asked her, what do you have in your house? And she said, she said, I have nothing there at all except a small jar of oil, olive oil, except and God said to me, what's your accept? When you look at life and you go, I got nothing to give. Well, I mean, there's this, but that's nothing. That accept in the hands of God is all I need. It's all you need. When God touches it, he can bring miracles. Another lesson that God spoke to me through this one little story, and here's what I believe. I believe that the Bible is inspired and God, God breathed. It's God's word to us. And then when I, when I read this book, the Holy Spirit shows up because the Spirit lives in me if I'm a Christian and speaks truth to me. And then the same Holy Spirit gives me power to live in a different way. So the Spirit inspires the Word. The Spirit brings the Word alive in my heart. And then the Holy Spirit of God gives me the strength to live for Him. So the, the final little part of that story that struck me, and, and it was where, where God said, you go with your sons in the house and you pour the oil, you fill up and you, you do your part. Work with me on this deal. And that struck me how God works that way. God didn't say, you wake up in the morning and there's gonna be 50 giant jars of oil. He said, you do your part, get involved. This is a partnership. And I thought, man, how, how much is that like God? Where he says, I'll be with you, but I wanna see you get involved in the game here. I wanna see you do your part. You're not gonna get to know the Bible just by owning a Bible. You're gonna know the Bible by opening it and God will do his part by his spirit to speak to you. You do your part by reading it. That's why every single week until Jesus returns, we're going to have a reading guide for you that gets you ready for next Sunday's message. There's at least a chapter each day of reading, and the pastor who's preaching picks those passages so you can read them and be ready for Sunday and really be immersed in God's word because we believe this is God's truth and we believe this is God's word. He still speaks, and I believe that with all my heart. So we need to dig into God's word because God speaks to us through it. Then the what? What do we measure when it comes to the scriptures? What is it that we should be measuring and thinking about? And here's the first and I think really important one. Do I actually know the Bible, the content, the stories, the narrative, the message? Do I actually know what it says? Do, do I know this story? And you, know, you can be a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and really not know the Bible. You get, get to know it by reading it, by opening it up and, and reading it and studying it. But to know the story of God. When I became a Christian, I didn't know any of the Bible. People say, well, certainly you know the story of like David and Goliath. I'm like, who are they? I didn't know anything. I didn't, you don't just, you're not born knowing the Bible. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't go to Sunday school. I didn't have any of that. And, and so you get to know the Bible by reading it. Do you know the Bible? I love it right now, some of the little kids in our church from, from uh, I think it's from kindergarten through fifth grade. They were invited to do a little journey called Eat This Book Challenge. Eat This Book, the Bible Challenge. And they're being asked for 21 weeks to follow a devotional set up for them and their parents to kind of learn and read through the Bible together. Not the whole Bible, but parts of the Bible. Do you know over 50 kids at Shoreline are involved in that? And if you ask, you ask your kid if they're part of it, are you? And if they're, if they're not, say, hey, it's, it's week seven. Let's jump in together. And then start reading the Bible with your kids. Do I know the Bible? You're going to get to know the Bible by reading it. This is interesting. If you look at how many chapters there are in the Bible, and remember, most chapters are one to two pages long. If you read just four chapters a day, six days a week, so you can take, take like on the weekend, pick one day on the weekend, Four chapters a day, six days a week. You would read the entire Bible in less than a year. People say, I've never really read the whole Bible. Why not jump in? Why not dig into God's word? Why not get into a Bible study or a precept upon precept class? Or why not be involved in learning in some way within the life of the church? The what? What do we measure? Do I know the Bible? And then also, do I believe the Bible? Do I have a confident trust and certainty? Do I believe that this is God's inspired word? So not just do I know it, but do I actually believe it's true? And like I said, there, there are great scholars who have studied the history of the Bible, the compilation of the Bible, and the whole process of how all that happened. And, and I've read a lot of that and studied that, and that helped me get my bearings overall on how the Bible was put together and how it works and my trust in the process. But there comes a point where you say, I've studied the best I can, and now I simply need to say, I hold to this as the word of God. There's a part that you use your mind for. There's a part you use your heart and trust in. 
But that's true in everything in life. My, my dad, who, when, when he was more of a hardcore atheist, now he's kind of a, I call him a friendly theist, but when he was like a hardcore atheist, um, I asked him about what he put his faith in. He said, well, I put my faith in truth and beauty and goodness. And I said, so you don't know those things exist? He says, well, no, I trust by faith. He said, everything at some point comes down to faith. And I choose to put my faith in this book. And it was interesting, uh, Billy Graham, probably the greatest evangelist who's ever lived, came to a moment in his life where he had to decide, do I believe that this book is true? He was actually at, at Forest Home Camp, a camp down in the, in the San Bernardino Mountains down in Southern California. And he was early in his ministry. He'd done a couple of crusades and they hadn't gone well. He didn't start with great success. He was also struggling saying, do I really believe that this is God's word and that this book is true? So he went out into the woods and he took his Bible and there's a tree stump. He set his Bible on this tree stump. And he wrote down later the prayer he prayed. Listen to this prayer. Listen to the honesty of this prayer. Oh God, there are many things in this book I do not understand. There are many problems with it for which I have no solution. There are many seeming contradictions. There are some areas in it that do not seem to correlate with modern science. I can't answer some of the philosophical and psychological questions that my friends and people are raising with me. It just was honest to God. I'm struggling. And it said, he then fell on his knees and prayed to God. And basically he said, God, I'm going to commit myself to embrace your word. And this is what he prayed. He said, Father, I'm going to accept this as thy word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts, and I will believe this to be your inspired word. He had thought about it. He had done the best he could to get there intellectually, but that gap that was still there, he said, I'm going to trust that this is your word. He went on to preach the message of Jesus to over 2.2 billion people. And this is a guy who said, I'm not sure if I can completely trust in this, but I'm going to choose the part that my mind can't understand. I'm going to choose to trust. And I want to challenge you in your own heart to say, I'm going to read God's word. And each time I do, I'm going to say, God, by your Holy Spirit, speak to me. I will hold to this as your truth and as your word. Here's another question you can ask yourself. Do I love the Bible? Do I love God's word? Now, listen closely. We are not supposed to worship the Bible. We worship God. But we can love the Bible because this book points us to the one who we worship and tells us all about Jesus. Do you love the word of God? In Psalm 119, verse 97, the psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. And when the Bible says meditate, it doesn't mean like kind of sitting in a grass field with your legs crossed, kind of humming to yourself. And when it says meditate, it means I think about it over and over. I let it saturate my soul and fill my mind and linger in my heart. I, I take scriptures, I just think about what they mean and say, God, speak to me, teach me. I meditate deeply, I think deeply upon your word. I love your word, God. And then you can ask yourself this question. Do I follow the Bible? Submission, surrender, discipleship. James says in James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word, don't just listen to what the Bible says, and so deceive yourselves. Well, how can listening to God be deceptive? Because you haven't done the last part. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Live it out. To just listen to God's word and not let it change your life is missing the point. You're kind of kidding yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Well, I, I got it. I, I, I know some information about the Bible. It says, do what it says. If the Bible says, learn to forgive those who've wronged you, you learn to forgive those who've wronged you. If the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her, husbands start to serve their wives in a way that they can't even intellectually understand, but they know God calls them to. When the Bible calls us to mutual submission, to submit to each other, we learn to do that. That's living out God's word. So then the when and the where, or the where and the when. How do I grow in my knowledge of love for and expression of biblical truth? How do I go deeper in God's word? And, and write some of these things down or lock them in your mind. And this is kind of the speed round. I'll kind of go through these quickly, okay? First, read the Bible. This is a radical. I know it's gonna blow your mind. If you wanna know this book, brace yourselves. You gotta open it, you gotta read it. I'm going to say that again because that's profound. I'm, I'm shocking myself. No, I mean, it's, you, you, gotta, you gotta know the content in it. Next, study the Bible. Uh, these three commentaries right here are books that are written about the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians is only about two and a half pages long in my Bible. And I have entire volumes about it while well, I'm preaching on Colossians at our nights of worship once a month at Shoreline. These are the three, com these are books that 
strong Bible-believing Christians who are academic and brilliant go through the historical background, the context, the time of the world at that time, and I learn from their insights, and it takes me deeper into God's word. And then this is my Living Insight Study Bible. My wife spent two years working with Chuck Swindoll on designing this thing and creating all the content for it, and it's probably the best book introductions to each book of the Bible and the best reflections I've ever seen done on the Bible. It's just brilliant. And uh, so I, I'm using these things together. As I prepare to preach at nights of worship, I'm starting with my Bible, but I go to these to help me go deeper because I want to study and get more insight to share with the congregation. So read, study, listen. Uh, there, are, there are parts of uh, people around the world that are, are referred to as oral learners. They, they, they learn by listening, by other people orally speaking, and they're listening and hearing God's word. And we actually uh, partner with the group, the uh, World Mission, who brings out the treasure in over 6,000 languages. The whole Bible, auditory. I mean, you can just, it, it's, it's solar powered, it's, it's, it's digital, and all you just put in the sun, get it going, hit the button, and they listen to the Bible. But you know there's places in the world where people don't read. There's places in the world where they don't even have their language even written. But you can give them God's word. This is one of the things we do as a church. This is one of our partner ministries. But for some of you, some of you learn better by listening than you do by reading. Fine. That's actually throughout all of history, but the primary people have heard the word of God has been listening more than reading. So if you say, I'd like to just listen to God's word. Everybody look at me. Especially if you like to listen more than you like to read. That counts. <laughs> that, that's just as good. Because you're getting God's word in your mind and in your heart, and it's changing your life. And so for some of you, so after the service today, if you, if you want a Bible and you don't have them, we have them in English and Spanish in the, in, the, uh, in the Connections Cafe. You can go over there and we'll give you a free Bible in English or Spanish. If you want like a good study Bible, we've got our, rolling, our new rolling library, I mean, our new rolling bookstore, and we've got lots of study Bibles that you can buy. We got, we're gonna give you the best price we can, but you can buy those so we, we can replenish them and have them for other people. But we also have copies that are free. But also, if you go over there and say to either Ben or pa Pastor, ben or Pastor Nate, hey, will you take my phone and show me a website or an app that I can put on my, have on my phone available and bookmark it, where I can open up the Bible, pick a chapter of the Bible, push a button, and it'll talk, the, my phone will read the Bible to me, they'll help you set that up. We want to get you opening God's Word. I know people that start every morning by grabbing their phone, hitting it, and going to the Shoreline website, clicking on their reading, and listening to the Word of God that we're doing as a congregation for the next week. So, well, they're just listening. They're not reading. That's okay if that's the way they get it into their heart and get it into their mind. So read. Read, study, listen. Discuss. Talk about what you're learning with other Christians. What are you learning from God's word? Have conversations about it. Teach. You want to get to know the Bible? Teach the Bible. And we need teachers to work with our kids, especially during this service. And since there's not, not very many seats left, some of you can maybe come to first or third service and go help teach kids about the Bible, second service. It's a little commercial. I'm not getting any amens. Okay. <laughs> but... but Amen for someone else, right? Not for me. But, but you know, being, when you teach God's word, you learn God's word. Sing the Bible. Find songs. There's a lot of our praise songs. They're just the Bible put to music. You want to memorize a passage, learn a song that's all Bible, and you'll have memorized the passage. Just learn what passage it is. And then begin to sing God's word. Memorize. Pick passages and commit them to memory. Start with Psalm 117. It's an easy chapter to memorize. Certain verses. Start with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. But get God's word in your mind. Meditate on God's word. Like I said before, it, it, meditating is just to think about it. You're not committing it all to memory, but you're just letting it sort of fill your heart and fill your soul. And over a couple of days or a week, you let the same passage fill your heart and fill your mind. Observe God's word. Watch to see how God's word is true. Listen to this, listen to this passage from Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a gossip separates close friends. And now watch and look around and see what gossip does to relationships. Go, oh man, God's word is true. Observe how God's word is coming alive in the world. Express and capture God's word. If you're an artist, take a passage that strikes you or a lesson from the Bible and sculpt something, paint something, write a song about it, express yourself. A friend of mine is a painter and I have this in my office, actually, uh, this, this, uh, this little uh, story of John the Baptist. And what he does interesting in his artwork is he has children write down how they understand the story. Then he takes art, his own art and children's art. He puts them together and tells the story from a child's perspective. So this is a little story of John the Baptist. And it says, John the Baptist lived in the desert, D-E-Z-E-R-T, with the wild animals. He wore itchy camel skins and ate bugs. He yelled a lot at people about how, what they were doing wrong. No wonder he lived in a desert. Uh, but that, you know, that's, that's somebody's, you know, that's somebody's, you know, perspective that hangs on my office wall to remind me. Um, 
And so there's, there's lessons that you can capture them in art. And most, of, most importantly, live God's word. Live it out. So finally, the how. Just, to, just some ideas on how do you, looking at ways we can grow forward in spiritual maturity related to the Bible. How do I go deeper into God's word? And here's just some quick ideas. Targeted service. You want to go deeper into God's word? When God's word calls you to serve or help or love or care, do it. You know, John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. It's before the Last Supper. It's near the end of his life. He washes their feet. And at the end of washing their feet, he says to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. That is what I am. And Jesus says this, if I, your Lord, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have set you an example you should do as I have done for you. That's, I memorize that in the Revised Standard Version, and I keep that in my heart. And so when God opens the door, even when it's tough, I say, okay, I need to learn to serve. Because that's what, how the scriptures lead us and change our lives. Targeted service. Personal life change. People should look at you and say, you're not the same. She's different than she was before. And you say, well, God's word is shaping me. He doesn't act the same way he used to act because God's word is changing my thinking and my attitude and my actions. When the, when the apostle Paul became a follower of Jesus, people you know, looked at, here's one of the things they were saying. They said, they've only heard this report about Paul. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Galatians 1.23. So people are saying, the guy who hated Christians and Christianity is now preaching Jesus. Something changed. <laughs> Something's different. Are you living differently? Life changed because of God's word. Relational transformation. How do you relate with people? In Colossians 3.11, we read this. Here in Christ, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, a barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The way we relate with other people gets healed because of Jesus. If you're immersing in God, yourself in God's word, he is gonna, gonna drive you to restored relationship, to offering forgiveness, to loving people even that seem unlovely to you and don't treat you well, and it changes your relationships. Acts of justice. In Amos 5, we're told, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. To let, to let justice flow out of you. And when you read God's word, you see a God who brings justice to the oppressed and to the poor and to the forgotten and to the outcast. And you know what? If, us, if we as individuals would live that out, we would have, wouldn't have to be wound up about every program out there as much as the church doing what it's called to do. There, 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 are, there are up to 500,000 churches in America, between 300,000 and 500,000 churches in America. If every church and every Christian was just showing justice, it would change our nation. You say, well, I don't know where to start. You know, show up here on Tuesday or Thursday and help give out food to the hungry. We do that as a church every week. Come on Tuesday or Thursday and give out clothing to those who need clothing. Come on a Saturday to a retirement center and go visit an elderly person who nobody's come to see in the last week. But Shoreline people show up to love them and talk about Jesus and care for them and bless them. And our outreach ministries in the community go on and on and on. And so many of them bring the justice and the love of Jesus. You can be part of that right here through Shoreline. A heart and attitude change. To look and say, does my attitude get shaped by God's word? You know, is my faith going deeper? Is my outlook on things changing because of God's word? Deeper devotion to God. You know, when Jesus was asked what's the most important of all the commandments, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Are you growing more passionate about God? If you, if you say, I'm really not, then open this book and let God speak to you. Growing more in holiness. We live in an unholy, mixed up, profane world. And we get tainted by it. And we don't even notice it. But this, this book just speaks again and again and again of living a different way and loving a different way. And, and, and sometimes it's confusing. And sometimes, I've been, a I've been a Christian a long time, about 40 years now. I've been a pastor a long time. And there's times where I still don't always understand all that it says. But I'll tell you this. The parts I do understand gives me plenty to work on. <laughs> plenty of growth. If you want to measure how you're doing in your Christian journey, am I knowing this word more? Am I living it more? Am I loving it more? Because a once a week snack on Sunday at church is not enough to keep you full. So I'm going to challenge you as you go from here, if you need a Bible, English or Spanish, you want a free Bible, just go right in the Connections Cafe and, and they'll give you one. If you want to buy a study Bible, Pastor Ben's there, you can do that. If you want to learn how to turn your phone into a Bible that talks to you, talk with them, they'll help you out with that. 
But I want to challenge you to go deep in God's word. It will grow you into maturity in your journey of faith. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak truth to us every time we open your word with a humble heart and ask you to speak. <coughs> Lord, you speak to your children. We are hungry to learn. So grow us in our knowledge of your word, our love for your word, and living out what it teaches changes through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.